an extraordinary human being. She is the global head of human capital management. That's global for Goldman Sachs. I, yeah, a few fans in. Yeah, not as many fans as T-Mobile, but still a few fans in. <laughs> Please put your hands together. I have met this woman quite a lot of times now, and I really do find her an impressive individual. So put your hands together and make big talent connect woohooing noises for Edith Cooper. <laughs> Usually your theme tune, do you request the banjo when you come out normally? No, but I think I might. I but I, I don't know, we have to do the, the warm up too. You can't just start with the banjo. <laughs> it's true, it's true. But I would like to think at Goldman Town Halls from now on you request a banjo theme tune. Okay. Um, so here's the thing, this is what I find impressive, Edith. Like, you run the whole world for Goldman Sachs. Now, when... I, Seriously, I'm in London and this I, have, I have this a, is serious. This is serious. I yes. have a lot of friends in banking in London because I do a lot of diversity and inclusion work. And they always, this is how they talk about Goldman. They go, well, she came from Goldman, you know. <laughs> or he went to Goldman. <laughs> it's like a hushed tone. It's like it's very, very, in, it's a very impressive brand. And you are responsible for the whole 35,000 people in the whole of the world, and, and Goldman, let us be clear, it's, it is its people, right? It is, that's, that's yeah. what it is. How do you get the confidence to go, yeah, I'll do that? Yeah, <laughs> me, I should run the whole world for Goldman Sachs. Like, what is your story? Because I would not do that. I would just be like, no. <laughs> I, I thought I had my story, but now I, I think Dennis's is much more interesting, so I gotta, <laughs> I gotta change up here a little bit. Uh, in all seriousness, I would say that, yes, with my colleagues, I'm responsible for uh, 35,000 people at an organization that's important, but the only way that we can stay relevant and important is that we recognize that we are always learning and we are always listening. And you here represent, uh, and those that are watching it online, I would suspect millions of people. Uh, and we have that in common. We've got to figure out how to create an environment where everyone can perform to their potential. So. Did I know when I was 16 years old, my first job, I was working in my dad's dental office. My dad was a dentist. And for some reason, he looked at me and said, you, young lady, should make false teeth. And so I left high school uh, at the end of the day, my classes, and I went to his office, and I started working on that craft. And I think early on, he realized, mm, I think she's probably not long for the dentistry world. Uh, and so I pursued the idea of starting a business, something that I could create where I could make an impact on, on broader universes. And, and it's interesting, that was quite some time ago, but it's language that we all use now. Uh, when I look back on my experiences, took me to business school, took me to finance, uh, investment banking, and I've never left. And I've never left because I've had an extraordinary series of opportunities most recently in the last 20 years where I've been able to work with incredibly talented, smart people who are a little bit on the edge, okay, often a lot on the edge, who uh, create opportunities for me and other leaders to bring it all together for impact. Uh, I would have not thought at any step of the way that I would have found my way to uh, be responsible for human capital management. But it does kind of make sense because there's no success that I individually have ever achieved without really understanding the significance of individuals that I work with, that work for me, that I work for, and bringing that together and learning for impact. Well, here's the thing. I already knew who you were before I met you, largely because I'd stalked you on LinkedIn. <laughs> Sorry, we don't say stalked. I, uh, we researched uh, <laughs> you on LinkedIn. And, uh, and I realized right away I knew exactly who you were because you wrote an article in 2016 that went viral. And in London, I had people sending it to me. They were not in recruitment. They were not in banking. They were comedians. And they were going, wow, like, look at what this woman's written about. And it was an article about how we need to talk about race at work. And I was like, whoa, I mean, it was an extraordinary article and you wrote it on LinkedIn and it, it really went viral. Did you know that you're kind of famous in London, by the way? Did you have a sense of that? Because you are. 
Yeah, so I, I, maybe I have this humility thing down. Edith Cooper famous, I, I gotta get my mind around that. Um, I do know that uh, prompting a conversation in a format like LinkedIn, using the, this, the leverage I have as a LinkedIn influencer, could potentially have reach. And so it is um, quite extraordinary that when I'm in London, whether it's in the airport, I was at a museum, a young man approached me and said, you know, I know you. I thought, what? Tinder, um, sure. But really, he, <laughs> yeah, I, I got that move too. Um, <laughs> Uh, but really, it was because he'd seen this piece. Let me just give you a little bit of history for those that haven't seen it. The art, title of the article was Why Goldman Sachs is Talking About Race and Why Human Interactions Matter at the Workplace. Uh, so our firm uh, has been on a journey for some time to create an environment where every individual could perform to their potential. We also know that in order to do that, we've got to have diversity broadly defined ethnically, gender, sexual orientation, culturally, we operate all over the world. And throughout the two decades that I've been at the firm, running businesses for the firm, client franchises, and more recently in my current role, we recognize that it's that human interaction that's the secret sauce. It's not so secret, actually. Culture really thrives when you get people coming to work and bringing their true perspectives, ideas uh, together. Uh, last year, uh, in America, and quite frankly, all over the world, there were rising conflicts with respect to, uh, I would like to say, lack of understanding. Uh, we at the firm had historically had conversations about LGBTQ rights. We'd been working at gender for a long time, but when we really got to the edge of talking about race, talking about the experience of those who were ethnically, racially different from the majority, we paused. We paused because we struggled at first to understand why that was a Goldman Sachs issue. Why was it something that we should be talking about in the workplace? External environments caused us to think about that differently. Honestly, staying close to our people and what mattered to them caused us to think about that differently. And it culminated last summer as a result of some tragic events that happened with respect to race, policing, and quite frankly, tragedy around America, our CEO, Lloyd Blankfein, said, I've had enough. We're going to bring together an opportunity for real conversation. So I joined our CEO and three of our other black partners on the stage. And as I walked out onto the stage, I looked out and I saw the people of Goldman Sachs. Of the 30,000 people, 35,000 people we have, a third of those people, some in the middle of the night, streamed in to hear about our experiences as black people in the workplace. And the thing that was extraordinary is it wasn't just you know, the millennials that want to bring their true selves to work. It was all of our people at the firm who recognized that there needed to be better understanding in a safe place with respect to different experiences. So coming from that vantage point, was it really courageous for me to write an article about race? Or was it the only thing I could do? Given the fortune that I've had to experience the workplace and the people that I work with, not to use that seat to further the conversation. And it's just been extraordinary. You know, the responses were, were more than I could have expected because it gave everyone an opportunity to share with me and to each other their differences. Because let me give you a heads up on something. Everybody is different from the person that you're sitting next to. You may be similar in some ways, but there is something if you take the time to have a real conversation, to connect in a real authentic way that you'll discover that you aren't really familiar with. That's what dialogue really means. So, so what, what was the consequence of speaking about race at Goldman, of you standing up, giving the town hall, talking about it? What happened after that? There was more conversation. There was more listening. There was more empathy. There was more connection. Uh, and that matters because you can't have a vibrant environment if people aren't comfortable getting on the edge of ideas, on experience, et cetera. The other thing that was really powerful uh, that I, I, I didn't really anticipate is that people came forward and started telling their stories. The connections that I made as a result of that were unbelievable. One of my colleagues who was hearing impaired called and said, uh, one, I'm sorry, it might be hard to understand, 
but I'm just getting comfortable using my voice. I wasn't comfortable going into a room and letting people know that I was always the first person in that room for a reason, because if I wasn't sitting next to the person who was speaking, I might not be able to hear, right? So that was a kind of difference that I wouldn't have anticipated would be sparked as a result of the conversation about race. It goes back to what I said before, we all have differences. Not talking about it is not acceptable. Silence is not approach that works. It's the conversations that really matter. So these guys out here, they will all have their own elephants in their own rooms. There are things that in all companies we don't like talking about, we don't, we don't want to talk about. You know, some peop somebody I was talking to yesterday said, you know, we have a problem that millennials don't want to work for us because of our company culture. And we don't have a pipeline. Millennials keep leaving and no one wants to talk about it. Somebody else was telling me that they have a gender imbalance problem that hasn't shifted in years, and just it's a hard conversation to have. So do you guys have elephants in your rooms? Yeah. Yes? Just, just, just give us a cheer if you have an elephant that you're thinking of now. <laughs> how do they bravely talk about it and put it on the table the way that you did? Like, how do you have that conversation? Because we would all love to be somebody who goes, I'm going to call it. But that's a difficult thing to do. What advice do you have to put your elephant out there and say, called Start elephant? Start with focus on understanding. Understand someone else's perspective. Listen. Listen to what people say and what people don't say. And honestly, start with the assumption that a difference of opinion is the driver not ill intent. Even if it is the latter, go into it with an open mind and understand the different perspectives of the, the people in the organization that you'll need to influence. Perhaps it comes back to all of those years where I worked with clients. Uh, to be someone who really understands clients, you've got to actually take the time to listen to what's front and center on their minds. What's going to drive their success? What are the pitfalls ahead for them? And when you do that, you're going to be best positioned to provide solutions that really matter to clients over the time. Working in talent-based organizations, and by the way, let me put this out here, it doesn't matter what industry you represent. It doesn't matter the niche or the breadth of your experience is as a company. What really matters is that you get the people equation right. And so if you start with this assumption of understanding, then you create more of an opportunity for real conversation and dialogue. The other thing that's critically important to appreciate is that what you say and don't say also matters. You know, I've always been told that poker should never be a thing that I get involved in for a variety of reasons, but most importantly, you know how I feel all the time. When someone says something that you think, wow, I totally disagree with that, the best way to keep that conversation going is not to give them the visual, like, seriously? That's the best you can do? That's not the way to keep the conversation going. Be present, be engaged, and walk into every interaction with an open mind with respect to empathy and understanding of someone else's perspective. Is it, is it also about linking it to the company culture or what, whatever it is that your company does? Can that be sure. helpful? Sure. So that's, that's, that, it's important to always start with what the value system is for your organization, which, quite frankly, should be an, a value system that you also own. Culture really matters. If we did a survey of all the mission statements, all the purpose-driven uh, functions of your organizations, you're going to hear probably similar things. Fairness, equality, communication, teamwork, changing the world, making a difference. These are all things that are grandiose in one sense, but quite frankly are very uh, uh, tangible. When you go into a conversation thinking that a guiding principle of your organization is teamwork, communication, collaboration, and equality, you have that front of brain, and that will fuel you to communicate in a way that people will listen. Because communication talking at is not the point, it's the dialogue that really matters. So it's when your core values come to life. In a way, they're sort of always sitting there, we don't, all our core values are pretty similar. So it's actually using them to go, hey, if this is what we really believe in, then let's have the conversation about this thing over here. Right, so it's one thing to write values on a piece of paper and to refer to your culture. It's another thing to actually live it. And all great organizations have to be reminded uh, of that. 
uh, we're not perfect, perfect, Goldman Sachs, your organizations aren't, and honestly, as individuals, we're not perfect either. And so it's really critically important to remind ourselves periodically of why does it matter? Why do human interactions really make a difference? And if you're really lost for the answer to that, go back to what some elder or grandparent has probably said to you in your lives, treat other people the way you'd like to be treated yourself. Um, all of a sudden, it all clicks together, and you could pursue the mission of making a difference with respect to the environment you're working in. Okay, so these are all lovely, warm ideas. We could put a lot of these things on Instagram with pictures of you know, rainbows in the background. We've got a lot of beautiful things going on, but how rainbows? do we... Uh, I, these are rainbows, my idea, but, <laughs> but you just said you're not allowed to go, really, is that the best you can do? <laughs> so, you know... Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> I'm going, to, I'm going to come back with waterfalls. Is that any better? <laughs> no, OK. So just put it on Instagram. No pictures. No pictures of kittens. So we've got this lovely open warm dialogue. We're, we're having it. We're living it. It's all great. How do we know we've made a change? Because just because we have the conversation doesn't mean we've changed anything. How do we know we've made a change? Well, you, you make a change because when you make a snap about rainbows, the other person comes back and I, that's my passion. You go, note to self, no <laughs> jokes about rainbows. It matters, it matters to her. How do you know you make change? Well, you pay attention. Pay attention, paying attention is a core ethos of any company. Uh, and how do we do that? We do people surveys. Uh, yeah, we've got uh, 100 questions and you say whether you really, really agree or you don't agree. But the thing that we really pay attention to in addition to the data that generates is what people say and what people say about the environment and whether we're achieving the objective that we hold ourselves to of creating an environment where everyone can perform to their potential. And it does sound in some senses high level, you know, up in the cloud, but in reality, it's a basic principle. So we measure it. The other thing is that we really buy into the fact that we will not have the best people at our firm if we don't have diversity of experiences and an inclusive environment where everyone can perform to their potential. And that has to be at every single level of the firm in every function around the world. It's deliberate and we must pay attention to each one of those points to see if we're living up to the expectation. And then we have to measure it, right? We have to make sure that we hold ourselves accountable as an organization to provide producing results in the same way that we do every aspect of our business. So you say we'd like to hire from more diverse backgrounds and uh, not just hire maybe you know, Ivy League or whatever. How do you do that? Like, like, again, this sounds like a lovely goal, but how do you know that you've made a shift? How do you, how do you measure it? Well, you know, think about why you're all here, right? You're all here to stay on the cutting edge of people's experiences and connect with that. The power of technology, LinkedIn being an extraordinary example, is that we now have reach that we couldn't ever imagined. When I took this job 10 years ago, our reach was really defined by the number of campuses that we could physically send people to in a finite period of time to get our message out. We would go to these campuses, we'd have materials to hand out, people would get up and talk, and then you know, we'd get emails. Now, we hire from more than 500 schools because we're leveraging technology to expand our reach. And why are we doing that? Because we are convinced that by doing that, we are going to really, really be capturing the best talent out there. And we're not the only organization that's trying to do that. And so we've moved away from, I would say, the closed ecosystem that is dictated by that initial human-to-human -human physical presence and physical connectivity to something that has far greater reach, far more um, expansiveness in, the, ten in the, the type of student and the background of people that we're attracting. And we know over time that this is going to make an extraordinary difference in our firm's production and impact, because with that kind of genius, oh my gosh, you know, how can we not be able to continue to evolve our firm to be important for our clients? And what's that software called? 
Well, it's a series of things. We have, you know, clearly the reach that we have through platforms like this. We went from the in-person interview to using, vi using video interviews. And why? Because there's a lot of unconscious bias in human interactions, right? It's the power of people. It could also be the challenge. I walk in the room. It's the end of the day. I look at a piece of paper. Eureka, you sound just like me. I'm loving you in the instant. It's the end of the day. I walk in the room. You don't really look like me. I feel like I don't have any of those biases, but I kind of do. I read your resume. I don't entirely get it. It sounds somewhat like a structured random walk, right? Because human interactions are complicated. So what we've done is we've taken video interviewing as the first round. We've started to really look in uh, the information that's contained in people's experiences and the data that it provides to get more sophisticated than just looking at GPA as an example. And we've added real structure and rigor to the questions that are being asked when we bring people in for live interviews. And I think that's a, a very important point to make. I don't think that we will get to a world where we will eliminate entirely that human interaction, right? Because that's important. You know, even in growth companies where their underlying business is technology, I spend a lot of focus working with our clients, our firm's clients and potential clients on once you get that product, once you get that idea up and running, how do you create scale that's offered through human interactions? It's very powerful. So how important are insights for you, insights that you can get from data? Like, how, how important are they? Like, how important is it for you, as someone who runs the whole world uh, for Goldman Sachs, uh, to, to understand the metrics that you're shifting? Uh, is, it, is it an important thing? Sure. So when I took on this role 10 years ago, there were a couple of things that were striking. One, uh, for me, uh, going into a situation that, quite frankly, I was not the expert in the room. First and foremost, the expertise that exists in our HR, we call it human capital management, uh, is extraordinary because the trains have to run on time. We've got to make sure that we're providing excellence with respect to execution on all things related to people. And I must say, I felt even in those early days how fortunate I was to be surrounded with people who, quite frankly, knew the science of people. Mm. The other thing, though, that I recognized was that the analytical muscle and the rigor that we apply to the businesses that I've been responsible for previously really were not applied in the same way in the talent people business. And so it was a perfect sort of confluence of events. So like think about the world 10 years ago. And so simply asking the question with my colleagues and other leaders of the firm, what are the analytical tools that we should be leveraging with respect to talent? Then you step back and say, well, I don't know, what are you trying to achieve? What you're trying to achieve is everything that I've been talking about, an environment where everyone can really perform to their potential and the levers that we have to accomplish that. As an example, managers. Who creates an environment for a person? It's the people who they sit next to. It's the person who they work for most directly. And if that manager is not great, does it matter? We had no science around that. Common sense would say, of course it matters. But we run a very data-rich organization. We do things, and then we want to measure the results. And so looking at data, the performance of managers across certain criteria, the performance of individuals, we realized that an individual who was a strong performer was 40% more likely to have a manager who was a strong manager. And why does having that data um, matter to informing instincts, right? We're talking about instincts and insight. because it proves what we know to be true instinctively. It proves that. And when you put that out there, it, 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 it gets to everyone's brain. It gets to the analytical brain. It gets to the emotional brain. Because at the end of the day, people want to achieve the true leverage that you get by creating an environment where people well, can Well, really also, thrive. you can insist on change. If you go, look, it's here in black and white. We're making more money. So you can then, you can, you can not just say, oh, well, I've got a feeling it would be better. You can show them the bottom line. For example, I have an instinct that Dennis is an awesome manager. Be because every time I say the word Dennis, that happens. I, I mean, either he's awesome or he just lets them drink all day. I don't know. My instinct is he's great. 
but uh, I bet if we looked at the data, probably he's doing a great job. But we still need to see the data to prove it, because it is possible he's just brought tequila. <laughs> at this point, I don't know, what would you say? You would have a much better <laughs> instinct than I would for this. I don't know, I'm not. So here's the thing. I, <laughs> I think it's wonderful that you're using a tequila ad analogy, and I really embrace that. Um, I, <laughs> I, uh, listen, I, I think that it's not one or the other. I think it has to be both. Mm -hmm. I think we have to have data support in the fact that what we are doing matters. Um, and if we have an environment where there's a greater collective conversation, uh, but we're not showing any results, people are right to say, why does this matter? Mm. Uh, and so I do think that data is important. I'd also say that, and this is a little, uh, it's critical, and I think that we're all re realizing it in organizations, it's okay to actually simply do it because you care, um, because it matters to you, and because we know instinctively that engaging with other people in a meaningful way will actually create more ideas, more innovation, and transformational change. And that's something that is extraordinary. We've really talked about that, that the pace of change is incredible. Mm -hmm. And so when you're working at companies, like I'm, I'm sure you represent here and online, you know, often you'll walk into a day to day and say, hmm, I don't know, is the move that I had yesterday gonna be the move that's relevant? That's kind of an uncomfortable thing. But as individuals, as organization, the sweet spot really comes from our ability to harness that edginess, that uncomfortable feeling, to create real idea generation and impact. And so, yes, data matters, but let's all try to think about getting ourselves in that place of being uncomfortable, and they get not just comfortable being uncomfortable, but inspired by it, because that's when stuff really happens. That is, that is, an, that is an extraordinary uh, insight, really, uh, to leave us on, but I want one more thing. You are, I don't know if I'm allowed to say this, um, I'm, if I, I don't know, I'm gonna announce it, you are leaving Goldman Sachs. I know, there was a ripple of shock that went through the audience. <laughs> and I'm imagining on the live stream. Um, you're leaving, and I'm gonna ask you this question. What is the note that you were going to write and leave in the drawer of your desk for your successor? What's it gonna say? Because that's the kind of real secret wisdom that we would like to lean in and hear now, because that's what we want to know. What are you gonna tell your successor? Congratulations, let me know how I can help. Uh, but you're not gonna need a lot of help because you are working with an extraordinary community of people. Specifically, the advice I'd give would be never stop learning, never stop caring. Understand that the work that you do in conjunction with our team in human capital management and our team at, of leaders at Goldman Sachs will make a difference to the individuals and to the success of the firm. Don't stop caring, respect the knowledge of those around you, and believe that what we do for the people of Goldman Sachs will determine the success of the future, not just this year or next year, but for the future. Ladies and gentlemen, I give you Edith Cooper.